we're going to talk about insurance demand. This factors that influence insurance demand. Okay. And the first are the insurance mandates. So what do we mean by that? What, what, what insurance policies are really mandated? That means they're required for people to have. Like auto insurance. Auto insurance, that's right. If you're a licensed driver, you have a vehicle, you have to have auto insurance, right? Health, health and, yeah, health insurance, you could say that now. That's right, because that's uh, part of Obamacare. You have to have it, right? Okay. And we talked about workers' comp for business. So that, you know, that all, that sort of builds in a certain floor to demand, doesn't it? You have to have them. So that builds in a certain floor. What else do you have to have? You go to buy a house, what does the bank ask? Homeowner's insurance. Homeowner's insurance. They want to make sure their collateral, the house, so is the collateral for their loan. They want to make sure that it's protected, right? So the mandates, the insurance mandates, are required policies, required policies by law, such as workers' comp, auto, liability, and homeowners is not required by law, but it's required by the banks, which is pretty close. Okay. Our second factor influencing demand is risk tolerance. Okay, now risk tolerance <coughs> is the insurance buyer's attitude, <coughs> the insurance buyer's attitude. Toward risk. <clears throat> okay. So on the corporate side, right? On the corporation side, the corporation might say, well, let's not buy collision insurance. Let's just self-insure any damage to our vehicles. They can do that. Lots of companies do that. That, but in order to do that, the management has to have a high risk tolerance, right? They have to be willing to reach into the company's pocket and pay for a new car if it gets totaled, right? So risk tolerance is really a subjective thing, isn't it? <clears throat> it's really a subjective notion. For example, even, even when President Obama passed Obamacare, there were still 35 million people that didn't buy it, right? They didn't want it. That's what they didn't want. And they're, you know what? If Ryan had passed his, they wouldn't have wanted his. These are risk takers. These are people who say, I don't want the health insurance. So risk tolerance exists at the company level where companies decide to self-insure, but it also it exists at the individual level. One of my brothers, for years and years, would not buy health insurance. Why do I need it? I'm healthy. It's nuts. That's why you buy it. Uh, it didn't matter. He didn't listen to me. But anyway, uh, risk tolerance is a subjective notion that exists among personal decision makers and company decision makers. Okay, financial status. Individuals with limited resources may not buy insurance because it's a luxury to them. They can't afford it. So financial status of the buyers. Okay. <clears throat> limited resources can reduce demand. 
So if you try to sell life insurance to somebody who is poor, you say, well, the annual premium, this is a great deal, the annual premium is only $3,000 a year. Well, it might be a great deal, but $3,000 a year is a lot of money if you're very poor. So, um, so that's an easy concept to understand. Okay, our fourth influencer is real services rendered. <clears throat> yep. So here we're talking about the fact that insurance companies give claim service, loss control, right? Claims services, loss control. They might give you some statistical analysis. So that influences demand for insurance. And management might say, you know what, we want those services. Let's buy it, let's buy the insurance. Okay, and our last one is tax incentives. comes into play in two ways. In property and liability insurance, the company gets a tax deduction for the premium when it pays it, right? So the company gets a tax deduction when it pays the premium. No, this would be for this I would mean, be for company, I mean, company. Sure. So, okay. Not not for individuals. You mean like you like when you pay your homeowner or something? Yeah. No, that's Can not deductible. So the company gets to deduct the premium from its taxable income as a normal operating business expense. Okay. So how about if the company self-insures claims? No, money they put aside for self-insurance is not tax deductible only when it's actually paid out for a claim. Then they can deduct the loss. Okay. So there are tax incentives, there are tax incentives associated with buying insurance, okay? What was the second thing? You said there were two things. There are two things. The second thing is, the second reason to buy um, insurance as a tax issue is on the health insurance side. And that is that the company gets to deduct the health insurance premium as an expense, but the fact that they're buying this insurance for their employees, the employees do not get taxed for that benefit as income. You follow me? If you're, if you're in business for yourself and you're a solo, right? You're a solo proprietor. You've got to buy your own health insurance. It costs a lot of money. But if you work for a company, usually they provide the health insurance. Usually. They may make you pay part of it, but they're paying most of it. That's not 1099 to you as income. Everybody follow me? Everybody, you know, they don't, the IRS doesn't say, well, wait a minute, that's got to be considered income. Okay, so these are sort of our five factors that influence insurance demand on a general level. Okay, so we talked about four factors that influence supply, and now these are five factors that influence demand. Sort of looking at the economics of insurance. Okay. Okay, one of the factors that comes into play with insurance, and we've talked about it before, is adverse selection. Can anybody tell me what that, what that means? I don't think we've talked about it. 
book? Who's came up in the homework? Okay. okay. I had to look it up, and now I can't. Oh yeah, so did I. Okay. I was like, I just saw that somewhere. It's the uh, the seller of uh, insurance uh, having information uh, regarding a certain um, like industry or uh, region. Well, I think you're I think you're generally in the right ballpark with that approach. I think you are. Um, but adverse selection is the tendency of people most likely to have a loss to want to buy the insurance. Okay? So in this one question where we were talking about Bashir and he's writing his, which takes a lot of guts, I think, he's writing his drought insurance, right? The adverse selection is people most likely to have you know, lose their shirt because there's a drought, they're the ones going to buy his insurance, right? People who live in a rainforest or something, they're not concerned. So, so adverse selection is the tendency of people most likely to have a loss, tendency of those most likely to have a loss buy the shirt, to buy the insurance. Okay, so, so if somebody came in here tonight and said, listen, sell you a million dollar life insurance policy, it can't be turned down, no physical, and the premium's $7,000 a year. Right? Who would buy? Who would buy? Struggling college students, right? They'd say, boy, that sounds great, but I'll pass, right? I mean, that's my guess, anyway. But who would buy it? Somebody who's sick. That's right, Kevin. Somebody who says, geez, the doctor told me last week, I'll be lucky to make it through the semester. Here's a chance. I take my last seven grand, buy the policy, my family gets a million bucks. Follow me? The tendency is Whenever there's a group, the most likely to buy insurance are those most likely to have a loss, right? I just read the book, When Breath Becomes Air. It's about a 36-year-old doctor who gets, he never smoked, by the way, and he gets diagnosed with lung cancer, right? Non-curable lung cancer. So it's a really sad book. But it does happen. It's one of the things he says in the book. So adverse selection is this. Now, Who's most likely to buy flood insurance? People on the coast. Maybe. People on the coast. People in a low-lying area. But they won't let them. They won't sell it to them. Oh, yeah, they will. They'll sell it to them. Mm -hmm. Teresa will. Well, it's high premiums. Yeah, the premiums aren't cheap. I agree with that. But the people most likely to buy the flood insurance are people living on, like Teresa says, on the coast, near the ocean, near a river, right? How about, um, let's see, earthquake insurance. Who's most likely to buy earthquake insurance? California. Californians, right, California. I don't have it, I, I don't have earthquake insurance. When was the last time we had an earthquake? You know? um, so, so adverse selection is a recognition of the fact that people most likely to have a claim are the ones who are going to buy the insurance, okay? All right, I'm glad we talked about that because obviously we didn't cover that before you had this homework, so I'll keep that in mind when I'm grading that, okay? It can't be folded for something we didn't cover. Um, That's good because I got that one. Right. That's adverse selection. Okay, how about moral hazard and morale hazard? We, we talked about those before. You know what moral hazard is, right? Mm -hmm. Moral hazard is when somebody does what? 